All right, everyone, I think it is a good time to start. First off, welcome back to our weekly edition of the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. We are fortunate to have Dr. Alex Gifford here with us, who is part of the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care and Sleep Medicine. Um, the CME code for today is 46468. That is in the chat, and I'll continue to drop that throughout the presentation. So, Dr. Gifford graduated from the Pennsylvania State University College of Medicine in 2003. He subsequently completed his residency in internal medicine, chief medical residency, and fellowship in pulmonary and critical care medicine at Dart Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. After 10 years on the faculty at Dartmouth, he joined the UH Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine in July 2021 as a clinical associate professor. He serves as director of the Adult Cystic Fibrosis Program and of the Cystic Fibrosis Therapeutics Development Center at the Leroy W. Matthews Cystic Fibrosis Center. He has received several career development awards and other research support from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. I'd like to now welcome Dr. Alex Gifford. The floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Zach. I um, really appreciate that uh, kind introduction. Um, so, uh, good afternoon, um, and today I'll be uh, sharing uh, some recent advances in clinical care and research in cystic fibrosis. Uh, this is uh, my disclosure and support slide. Um, I am a local principal investigator on several uh, industry-sponsored CF uh, trials, um, and I've received funding uh, for research from the uh, CF Foundation and uh, Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. Um, I just want to take us through some uh, learning objectives for the talk, um, of which there are three. Um, I'd like to first explain how mutations in the CFTR gene are classified according to how they cause uh, CFTR protein dysfunction. And then uh, we'll talk about the clinical benefits that uh, CFTR modulators um, have um, imparted to the health of most people with uh, CF. And then we'll finish up uh, with a, uh, an overview of some contemporary research strategies to restore CFTR function in people with CF who don't have uh, an option uh, for modulator therapy. So just a bit of uh, background. So um, CF is uh, the most common life-shortening genetic disease among uh, Caucasians, um, occurring in roughly 1 in 2,500 to 1 in 3,000 uh, births. Uh, there are at least 100,000 cases worldwide and about 31,000 cases in the U.S. Um, there are over 2,100 mutations in the CFTR gene uh, that uh, encodes CFTR, which is an epithelial uh, chloride and bicarbonate channel. Um, and one of the fascinating aspects of CF care for me over the years is that uh, this heterogeneous uh, clinical manifestations of CF are not altogether explained by uh, CFTR genotype. And, and that has uh, led to um, a theory um, called the modifier gene theory that, that other genes do um, end up modifying the clinical course of people with uh, CF. So CFTR is widely distributed throughout the, the body. Uh, we won't have time today to talk about all the complications that uh, develop based on where CFTR is expressed. Um, but just for background, I should mention that uh, roughly 85% of uh, CF patients have exocrine pancreatic insufficiency um, due to fibrofatty changes in the pancreas. Um, about 5% of kids and 30% of adults um, have diabetes um, associated with CF. Um, male infertility is um, ubiquitous, and uh, female subfertility is also well recognized. Um, and you can see from uh, this slide in a recent review that there are many other body systems um, affected um, in this disease. Um, we'll dig into uh, the sweat gland and the lungs in a little greater detail. So CF is a, a monogenetic uh, autosomal recessive disorder um, that follows classic uh, Mendelian genetics. Uh, the gene is on chromosome 7, and the carrier frequency of CFTR mutations um, in Caucasians is about 1 in 25 to, to 30. Um, when I originally learned about the autosomal recessive pattern of inheritance, the uh, panel um, in the upper left here um, of two carrier uh, parents having uh, progeny with a 25% chance of uh, the disease um, was uh, more the norm. Uh, but now, with uh, median predicted survival of people with CF at an unprecedented 50 years of age, uh, many more uh, folks with CF are having uh, families of their own, 
and that makes the um, upper right and lower left panels where we have a CF uh, parent um, uh, as the, the proband um, uh, more relevant. It's really important to realize that CF is not just a disease of Caucasians. Uh, in uh, the CF Foundation patient registry uh, data from 2020, 9.6% um, of the population identified as Hispanic or Latinx, and 3.5% of registrants um, identified as Black or African American. Um, and most of these uh, non-Caucasian um, individuals are children. The 2,000 plus uh, mutations in CFTR um, are organized into classes and basically these mutations um, cause quantitative or qualitative defects in uh, CFTR function. Um, the class 6 mutations are very rare um, so we're, we're not going to cover those in detail but I'd like to take you through the other uh, categories because um, some of the drugs we talk about later, um, their mechanisms of action depend on uh, genotype. So class 1 mutations in uh, CFTR are called nonsense or X mutations because these single nucleotide alterations cause uh, premature termination or co uh, stop codons. Um, in the human genome, there are three stop codons you can see listed there. Um, and for this hypothetical gene, um, the uh, first base pair in the middle codon is C and G, uh, which would translate to um, a uh, C uh, in the um, uh, middle uh, mRNA codon and, and eventually um, a glycine residue uh, during translation. Um, in the right panel, we see a TA substitution um, in that middle codon, which then uh, turns the uh, codon, um, in, or the um, sequence in the mRNA, rather, um, into uh, the stop codon UAG. And so the uh, peptide translation would stop at that point. Um, and the bottom line is that um, People with uh, class 1 CFTR mutations do not have any CFTR protein expressed in uh, the epithelial cell membrane. Um, the distribution of X mutations or class 1 mutations um, varies widely. Um, just as an example, um, one study from Europe um, involving 23 countries and 25,000 individuals um, found that uh, these uh, mutations were uh, found in about 16% of the population, but there was a lot of variation um, among uh, the countries in terms of prevalence. Class II CFTR mutations uh, cause peptide misfolding, which leads to structural instability and targeting for degradation within the cell um, via the proteasome. Uh, these mutations uh, prevent binding of chaperone proteins like HSP70 um, near the membrane spanning domain of, of CFTR um, as it moves through the um, uh, factory of the cell toward the um, epithelial cell surface. Uh, the F508 DEL mutation uh, causes a deletion of phenylalanine at the 508 position in CFTR, um, and that corresponds to uh, one of the nucleotide binding domain. Um, worldwide, uh, F508 DEL accounts for about 70% of uh, CFTR genes, making it the uh, most prevalent by far. Um, but it's really uh, distributed um, uh, heterogeneously around the world. So, for, for example, um, a study in Brazil showed that um, only 48% uh, of uh, individuals in a large screening study uh, carried F508 DEL, um, which would have implications for uh, the prevalence of CF disease and carrier status. Um, F508 DEL is also only found in about one-third of black and Hispanic um, people with CF in the, the U.S. Um, the class 3 and class 4 mutations um, highlight uh, the fact that CFTR is uh, a gate. Um, it's an ATP-gated uh, anion channel, um, and it's very unique um, in that uh, it is the only uh, known uh, ATP transporter that serves as an ion channel. Most of the other um, ATP aces um, have other transport functions. Um, and then, interestingly, um, it's the only uh, channel that consumes its ligand, which is ATP, um, during the, the gating cycle, so this process of going from uh, closed to open and, and closed again. Uh, so you can see by this diagram that uh, class 3 and class 4 mutations are known as conductance or, or gating mutations. Um, these mutations don't affect uh, CFTR trafficking to the plasma membrane of epithelial cells, but just um, uh, reduces the rate at which chloride ions are conducted. 
Um, and uh, both of those processes are tied to uh, phosphorylation of a regulatory domain and ATP hydrolysis. Um, and these mutations interfere with those steps. Uh, class uh, 5 mutations are um, known as splice mutations, and these cause um, abnormal mRNA processing. So uh, these mutations uh, compromise the normal uh, process of introns being excluded, exons being retained, um, and other mRNA processing steps so that we can get a template uh, for uh, CFTR to be um, created by translation. So um, in class 5 mutations, we do get some translated uh, proteins, so you can find CFTR um, on the surface of epithelial cells, um, but uh, a significant proportion of the transcripts are um, degraded, uh, so there's a reduction in signal. And this slide, um, again, using uh, CF Foundation patient registry, underscores the, the very high prevalence of f 508 del um, which um, is found in about 86% of people with CF. Um, the next most uh, prevalent mutations, um, the class 1 mutation G542X and the gating mutation G551D um, are found in only 4 to 5 percent of uh, individuals. And then you can see that other mutations are much less uh, common. So, so what are the physiologic consequences of all this genetics? Um, and what we can start with is talking about the ecrine uh, sweat gland. Uh, normally, these uh, glands secrete a hypotonic sweat on the skin surface. Um, and in the normal uh, situation, which is uh, the middle panel here, um, sodium is resorbed uh, through from the lumen through the uh, epithelial sodium channel uh, called ENAC, which is in red. And CFTR uh, conducts chloride um, from the lumen into the interstitium. Um, uh, to, to counterbalance that. Um, normally there's a little bit of a negative uh, intraluminal charge based on these ion movements, uh, but in CF, um, because we don't have CFTR, um, we end up having um, uh, too much uh, salt, uh, sodium and chloride in the uh, uh, sweat duct, and that uh, makes it uh, hypertonic uh, relative to the normal state. And it also increases the um, negative uh, luminal charge, uh, which is the basis for uh, the, the sweat test. So when we uh, perform a sweat chloride collection, um, pilocarpine, which is a, a stimulant for sweating, um, is is drawn into a small area of skin by ionophoresis, which is in the, the top right panel. And uh, then a device like the macroduct coil uh, shown at the bottom right uh, collects the sweat. And sweat chloride is, is still um, an important test, um, even though um, we have known about it for, for decades. So in 1956, Dr. Paul de Santignis uh, reported that uh, cases of cystic fibrosis of the pancreas um, had distinctly elevated uh, sweat chloride measurements compared to uh, healthy subjects or controls with other respiratory diseases. And based on comparing these uh, histogram uh, distributions here, you can see that uh, things diverged around 60 milliequivalents of uh, per liter. Um, and so today, uh, sweat chloride testing uh, still factors prominently into uh, diagnostic algorithms. And so the, the presence or absence of two pathogenic CFTR mutations coupled with uh, sweat chloride measurements that are elevated, um, according to this algorithm, um, allow us to confidently confirm or exclude CF um, in a number of cases. So moving from the sweat gland into the lungs, um, being a pulmonologist, that's, uh, I like that. Um, so we're uh, going to see uh, the normal function here on, of uh, CFTR. So normally uh, we have, again, this um, ENAC, uh, epithelial sodium channel, that uh, transports sodium um, away from the airway surface liquid into the epithelial cell. And we have um, ion counterflow of chloride through the uh, CFTR um, protein. And so the, the net effect of this is a relatively balanced osmotic gradient that limits uh, paracellular water absorption, and that maintains uh, proper height of the airway surface liquid, which is important for uh, ciliary uh, motility and, and clearance. 
in CF um, because uh, we have either, again, qualitative or quantitative defects in CFTR function. Uh, we have uh, ENAC um, absorbing sodium from the airway surface liquid, um, and CFTR um, usually puts the brakes on uh, ENAC activity, and so that goes uh, unchecked. Um, and we also don't have the ability to um, uh, 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 secrete chloride into the uh, airway surface liquid. So the net result here is this imbalanced osmotic gradient where we have uh, excess uh, paracellular water absorption and so we have a thicker and shorter airway surface liquid uh, layer uh, which sets up inflammation and um, infection. And so this is uh, schematically shown here. Um, we have this vicious cycle um, of lung damage uh, because of those molecular um, and cellular factors. So we have mucus retention in uh, mid, middle and small airways. Um, this is an environment where infection can take hold very early in life, um, which uh, hastens more inflammation um, and uh, lung damage as shown by the uh, CT scan um, in the lower left panel uh, with bronchiectasis in the right upper lobe. Um, this is, uh, again, a figure that's commonly cited from the CF Foundation Registry showing uh, the pathogens that contribute to these infections. Um, in children, uh, MSSA and Haemophilus influenzae tend to be uh, the most prevalent um, infections um, and waning prevalence uh, going into adolescence. Um, as we uh, get into adulthood with, with CF, we see more MRSA and Pseudomonas aeruginosa um, taking hold. And there are other um, predominantly gram-negative uh, rods uh, that cause infection uh, with low and relatively stable uh, prevalence uh, into adulthood. And unfortunately, respiratory failure remains the main cause of death in uh, this population. Um, and these uh, figures just really drive home the point um, about how tenacious these uh, mucus plugs are. They, they literally um, uh, obstruct these uh, small airways and then uh, cause the bronchiectasis that you can see on this um, uh, uh, specimen um, in the middle uh, panel. And then again, uh, the bronchiectasis and mucus plugging is what we see on a CT scan on the right. So what interventions can we uh, bring to bear against this uh, cycle? So um, first, um, we use um, a number of medications designed uh, to uh, open up the airways, uh, bronchodilators, um, recombinant human DNAs, which um, chews up uh, human uh, DNA contained in neutrophils uh, that, are, that are abundant in the airway, um, and hypertonic saline, which restores some of that osmotic balance, at least transiently, um, to help with mucus uh, mobilization. Um, we bring to bear um, various airway clearance modalities like um, high-frequency chest wall oscillation, uh, shown in the upper uh, left. Uh, we use antibiotics uh, quite a bit uh, because we have all of those pathogens to deal with. Um, and we finally uh, employ uh, anti-inflammatory strategies um, using azithromycin in many cases, um, high-dose ibuprofen and uh, corticosteroids. And as you might imagine, uh, the treatment burden is pretty high in the CF population uh, with all of these things. Um, multiple studies have looked at this over the years, and it, it's literally hours a day uh, doing these inhaled medications and the airway clearance. Um, and if pulmonary exacerbations um, end up being treated with IV antibiotics, um, those courses usually last for about two weeks, um, with much of that time being uh, spent in the hospital. So what's the return on uh, investment? So um, this is um, a slide showing um, the effects of some of our mainstay therapies that we've had for uh, decades um, on uh, FEV1, uh, forced expiratory volume in one second, which is a key uh, lung function uh, measurement by spirometry. Um, some of the data um, on inhaled antibiotics um, are short-term. Um, at four weeks, um, there was a comparison of hypertonic saline to normal saline um, that also showed some benefit of that. Um, and then uh, some uncontrolled uh, studies of airway clearance modalities uh, that are longer um, have shown a benefit as well. So we, we hope that all of these uh, treatments are additive at preserving uh, lung function. But you can see the effects are fairly modest, um, 5 to 12% predicted in um, lung function. 
when you take a, a, a higher uh, view of these studies and you look at uh, what happens over time, so you zoom out to uh, several weeks uh, here um, in some of the studies, um, you still see this uh, decline in the lung function that, that just seems to be um, irrespective of uh, various therapies. And so that's what we uh, deal with, is trying to slow down that uh, rate of lung function loss. These uh, data here um, give us some sense of what we should or could expect in terms of uh, annual lung function decline in, in people with CF. Uh, these are data from uh, a large epidemiologic study of CF, um, including more than 20,000 patients um, in North America. And the left panel highlights the fact that adolescence is a really risky time um, in CF. Uh, we see this um, accelerated uh, drop in lung function, and then it tends to be a little bit more stable into adulthood. And um, in the right panel, you can also see that uh, those annual changes uh, fall below the um, expected 2% per year uh, decline in adolescence. Studies have looked at specific reasons for um, accelerated lung function decline and uh, perhaps not surprisingly, several specific um, pathogens um, have contributed to that, um, uh, conferring um, anywhere from a half to um, almost three quarters of a um, percentage uh, decline per year uh, difference in FEV1 versus non-infected uh, patients. Um, Pulmonary exacerbations, uh, which are some events we're going to talk about here, um, almost have this dose-dependent uh, effect on undermining lung function um, and of greater magnitude in, than individual infections. So because um, these exacerbations are um, major um, health events for our population, and uh, there's a recent uh, study of uh, pulmonary exacerbation management I wanted to take you through, um, we'll just have a word about these. So um, if you treat people with CF, you kind of know one of these when you see one, uh, but unfortunately, uh, lack of a standardized definition means that uh, they're handled uh, very differently um, among institutions um, um, in some cases. Um, but for the, for the most part, um, some combination of a patient having worsening respiratory or constitutional symptoms, um, a, a need for antibiotics uh, constitutes um, an exacerbation. Um, individual um, exacerbations have been associated with increased mortality, um, a decline in lung function, uh, lower quality of life, and these things are expensive, um, especially when uh, hospitalization is involved, um, to the tune of um, roughly thirty-seven dollars to $40,000 um, in some studies. Uh, there was a, an important study group convened a number of years ago now um, called the Standardized Treatment of Pulmonary Exacerbation, or STOP, um, group, and they uh, conducted a, a, an observational study um, to lay the groundwork for um, a controlled trial I'm going to go through in a minute. Um, this group found that 20% uh, of uh, subjects that they observed uh, during pulmonary exacerbations actually had their best lung function within the previous six months, which just emphasizes that that's, uh, lung function is one part of the puzzle. Um, and 65% of uh, subjects which means that a third um, didn't uh, regain uh, greater than 90% of the lung function associated with uh, that exacerbation. So, so not all patients get back to their uh, lung function baseline. So uh, just actually in December, um, in the Blue Journal, um, a controlled trial was uh, published from this uh, STOP uh, study group, and it was designed as a divergent uh, pragmatic trial um, that used a subject's early spirometric and symptom improvement, or lack thereof, um, to inform randomization into one of two arms. And so one arm of the study tested a non-inferiority hypothesis of 10 days of antibiotics versus 14 um, if those uh, individuals had a robust early response um, using a, a, according to a couple metrics. Uh, and the second arm uh, tested a superiority hypothesis of 21 days versus 14 days uh, for individuals who really didn't respond um, robustly at the beginning. So the, the panel on the left here shows how um, this group um, uh, identified these two uh, cohorts for study. Um, and they used a combination of uh, lung function, so an 8% or more improvement in FEV1 uh, between 7 to 10 days of uh, starting IV antibiotics, and a significant reduction in symptom score, um, which is uh, captured during, uh, with the chronic respiratory infection symptom score, or CRIS score. 
Um, and so um, a significant bump in lung function, significant decline in symptom burden uh, within that early phase of, of treatment was uh, defined as an early robust response. And the uh, patients who didn't have that were, were in a non-early uh, robust cohort. This is just a, a schema of the study, so it makes a little more sense. So there was a baseline visit um, and uh, a randomization visit, visit two, um, somewhere between day seven and 10. And then uh, based on that uh, early responsiveness to treatment, uh, there was randomization one-to-one -to, -one, um, to those uh, two um, study arms. And so this is a busy table that I adapted from uh, their publication, but uh, suffice it to say, um, these, uh, this study involved um, individuals with, with fairly good uh, nutritional status, um, mostly adults um, in their uh, late 20s um, or, or thereabouts, um, and uh, they had some degree of um, impaired baseline lung function, pretty much what we expect for that age range. Um, the prevalence of 508 DEL uh, CFTR was uh, pretty uh, expected based on registry data and diabetes was um, also not um, excessively represented. Uh, the vast majority of uh, subjects observed during treatment um, in the study were um, hospitalized and um, the other point to make is that within each uh, group, the early res robust responders or the non-early robust responders, uh, randomization worked. So even though they were very different cohorts um, between interventions uh, within a cohort, they were, they were similar baseline. So this was the, the key finding or set of key findings from that study. Um, and uh, what did we learn? So uh, we learned that uh, for early robust responders um, who had a good bump in their lung function, their symptoms went down uh, pretty uh, briskly within a week, um, there was uh, 10 days was not inferior to 14. And then in the cohort that did not really have as uh, much of a response, um, 21 days didn't end up being superior to 14, uh, which was an important lesson because we're always wondering, well, maybe if we just treat a little longer, they'll get better, right? And, and so this study would not suggest that. Um, and there was also no significant within group differences um, in the extent to which symptoms uh, improved according to uh, this CRIS inventory. The group also looked at uh, whether there was any difference in time to next uh, pulmonary exacerbation between these two groups and um, these Kaplan-Meier uh, curves within the ERR, um, a robust population, um, were not significantly different. Um, and in the uh, group that was not found to be um, early robust responders, um, there was no difference between 14 and 21 days of therapy with respect to risk of their next uh, flare-up. So taken together, I think that these uh, uh, findings of the STOP2 study um, should lead uh, CF clinicians to question whether we really need to treat patients with IV antibiotics for um, as long as we um, have tended to. And, and perhaps it underscores the importance of uh, more uh, objective um, assessment of uh, near-term improvement, like getting spirometry and using some uh, kind of symptom um, assessment. So fortunately, uh, most people uh, with CF now are candidates for treatment with uh, orally bioavailable drugs that uh, restore CFTR function enough to uh, confer health benefits. So we're gonna take the next uh, few minutes and talk about what happens when we fix uh, CFTR. And to really appreciate how much progress has been made toward pharmacologic restoration of, of CFTR function, you have to rewind uh, back to 1989. And at that time, uh, the CFTR gene was localized to chromosome seven. Um, it was subsequently cloned and, and sequenced. And um, several of the authors on these uh, seminal papers have um, you know, deep ties to, uh, to Case Western. The um, aforementioned advances in understanding the genetics and heritability of CFTR um, facilitated the development of um, cell models where uh, we could test drugs using high throughput uh, screening. So interestingly, um, Fisher rat thyroid cells, or FRT cells, became uh, the go-to cell line for some of these experiments. And um, I've all, I always wondered why, so in prepping for this, I, I read about it. Um, so these cells, when they're grown in a, a culture plate, um, they have a high transepithelial resistance, uh, which is important if you're doing um, electrophysiologic studies um, uh, of CFTR function. 
And also interestingly, these uh, cells do not um, inherently contain any uh, cyclic AMP regulated chloride channel, so there's no um, CFTR analog here. So um, if you can engineer CFTR to be expressed in these cells, that's what you're studying. Um, and uh, there have also been uh, modifications to these uh, cell lines uh, such that um, if uh, you have a, a drug candidate that uh, causes chloride to be um, uh, secreted from the cell, um, there's a, another fluorescence protein um, in the membrane that, that you can see the signal decline, and that's how you would uh, know that there's a, a potential hit there. So this is um, what really started um, the drug development uh, process in CF. Um, this slide showing uh, sweat chloride as a function of percent uh, normal CFTR uh, protein function just makes the point that we um, may only need to restore 25% of protein function to uh, start to have a phenotype that looks more like carrier status or um, even um, normal uh, status without any CFTR mutation at all. So uh, we can't let perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, we know from clinical trials and in vitro studies of CFTR function that um, some modulators, uh, CFTR modulators, are associated with uh, more dramatic improvements in uh, lung function um, and better restoration of CFTR activity, which is um, kind of highlighted here by showing a relationship between um, those two uh, parameters. So um, just to, to focus on the most recent um, and impactful developments regarding uh, modulators, um, we're going to talk about those that are thought of as highly effective. So this would be um, Ivacaftor for patients with those gating mutations and the triple combination of two corrector molecules called alexacaftor and tezacaftor plus the potentiator of CFTR function called um, ivacaftor. And just to make it easier, I'm going to call that triple combination um, ETI uh, for short. Um, CFTR potentiators um, make CFTR work better um, at the cell surface. So they um, increase uh, chloride conductance in uh, patients who have mutations that are uh, permissive. And um, again, Ivacaftor shown here, um, branded as uh, Clydeco, um, was the first uh, potentiator developed. And this is the population it was studied in. So um, individuals with CF who had at least one G551D uh, CFTR allele, so about 5% of the population. And this study was published a decade ago, um, or thereabouts, in the New England Journal. And it showed that Ivacaftor um, dramatically improved lung function um, to the tune of about 11% predicted um, versus placebo at 24 weeks. And it slashed um, the risk of pulmonary exacerbation by 55% at the end of uh, 48 weeks. So we had never seen um, uh, drugs in CF that had this uh, magnitude of uh, impact. Uh, there was also um, a sustained, or a large, I should say, and sustained uh, decline in sweat chloride um, associated with these data, um, attesting to the, the mechanism of action um, on CFTR, um, uh, again, on the order of magnitude of about 50 millimoles per um, liter. And I just thought it was interesting that it's taken about 10 years to kind of figure out where does Ivacaftor bind on CFTR to actually uh, do all of this uh, manipulation of the activity. And it turns out that Ivacaftor may kind of um, have um, uh, more than one uh, binding site on the molecule, so kind of interesting stoichiometry there. Um, open label studies have uh, been performed uh, showing uh, uh, extended use of uh, Ivacaftor in G551D patients. Uh, the left panel shows uh, data from uh, patients who are over 12 years old and those who are 6 to 11 years of age are in the right panel. And basically show that um, uh, patients who crossed over from placebo um, experienced um, a clinical benefit uh, with respect to lung function in, in both of these cases um, that was similar to um, individuals who got active drug um, during the um, uh, randomized uh, placebo controlled part of the study. Um, the other point here is uh, that these uh, open label extension studies confirmed that the, the health benefits were durable um, in this uh, comparison out to 144 weeks. Um, along about this time, there were some important um, in vitro experiments uh, that supported uh, the use of Ivacaftor in patients with CF who had uh, gating mutations other than G551D. And for some of these mutations, which I 
might not expect you to see totally because the font is small, but um, up at the very top of uh, column B, um, uh, Iva Kafter imparted even uh, supernormal levels of uh, chloride transport in these uh, assays. And so uh, the label um, for Iva Kafter was expanded in response to these and other uh, supportive data. As we moved toward uh, trying to see if Ivacaftor could benefit uh, younger children uh, with CF, um, we started to run into some interesting questions about clinical trial endpoints. Um, many of, of those on the call know that uh, young kids can not usually perform spirometry um, all that well, uh, which means that we have to wonder about the utility of um, FEV1 as a primary outcome measure. Um, also, kids are generally healthier, so you also have some ceiling effect uh, when you look at uh, that as a, a primary outcome measure in a, a controlled trial. So some of these um, studies of modulators in younger uh, CF populations have focused on uh, safety and tolerability. Um, and a good example of that would be an association between Ivacaftor use and risk of non-congenital cataracts. Um, so um, kids on Ivacaftor need to be uh, monitored for those uh, ophthalmologic changes. Um, we also um, have focused on pharmacokinetics. So is the drug exposure in, uh, at reduced doses in kids, you know, similar to uh, that that we saw in the adult uh, trials of Ivacaftor? Uh, these uh, studies have also focused on anthropometric measurements, kind of nutrition indices uh, like BMI change, um, and also uh, biomarkers like sweat chloride, uh, fecal elastase, which is uh, reduced in the stool and when there's pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, um, and immunoreactive trypsinogen, uh, which is um, elevated um, in the blood and, and part of a, a newborn screening uh, panel. So this is uh, one of the, the open label studies of Ivacaftor Iva in uh, young kids aged two to five years uh, with gating mutations. And uh, these are the pharmacokinetic parameters I mentioned before, uh, basically confirming that um, at reduced doses um, and, and also with a weight-based dosing uh, uh, scheme, uh, the drug exposure was uh, similar to that that they saw in Ivacaftor studies in adults. Uh, in this study, uh, they also saw um, significant uh, reductions in sweat chloride, um, a biomarker attesting to activity. Um, and then in the right panel, um, curiously, they saw um, in, um, I think it was 23% uh, of subjects, um, an increase in fecal elastase level um, that is actually above the threshold um, at which we would diagnose a, a, a patient as pancreatic exocrine insufficient. Um, so the, the question there is whether uh, modulator therapy early on in life, when maybe there's not as much end organ damage, could actually um, start to um, uh, fix that. So this is the, the current summary of uh, the label for Ivacaftor used by people with CF. So um, we have it uh, available down to age four months and older um, for um, individuals with um, a mutation in this panel. Um, and we're always going to the package insert to, to try to look these things up. We'll talk next about uh, correctors. So um, these uh, were the next uh, class of uh, modulator to be developed, and these drugs increase the amount of CFTR at the epithelial cell surface. Um, I only present Tezacaftor and Ivacaftor here because they're constituents of uh, ETI. Um, we're not going to talk about Lumacaftor, which was an earlier uh, generation uh, 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 corrector. Excuse me. And. Again, um, there's been some latency in trying to figure out exactly how these small molecules fix CFTR function. And um, having a, a bent in chemistry, as you might have picked up on already, um, you know, I was curious about how these things do bind. And so um, the uh, correctors, Lumacaftor and uh, Tezacaftor, um, ending, uh, end up binding to um, some domains in the transmembrane uh, spanning domain um, that help uh, CFTR fold properly into the uh, uh, appropriate structure. So we're going to go through some of the clinical trial data now of this triple combination modulator. So um, these are from the uh, F508-DEL um, heterozygote study um, where uh, there was uh, required to have a minimal function mutation on the non-F508 allele, and this was done in uh, age 12 years and up. And here, uh, placebo uh, was um, uh, feasible um, as part of the study, and we saw these dramatic increases on par with what we saw with Ivacaftor in uh, lung function at uh, 24 weeks. Um, 
the, uh, these studies have also uh, incorporated um, a metric called the CFQR RDS, um, uh, or R, um, RSD rather, um, and that is uh, the Cystic Fibrosis Questionnaire Revised uh, Respiratory Symptom Domain. And um, the, the point to make about this slide is that the minimal clinically important difference in this uh, quality of life uh, inventory is known, and it's four points. So uh, what they saw in these clinical trials were increases on average of up to 20 points um, at 24 weeks, so far exceeding what would um, be thought to be noise relative to symptom improvement. Uh, in this uh, heterozygote study, um, the investigators also saw, uh, saw a 63% lower annualized uh, rate of all exacerbations versus placebo, um, a 71% lower rate of those uh, requiring hospitalization, and a 78% uh, lower annualized rate of uh, exacerbations treated with any IV antibiotics. Um, and so this was, was really groundbreaking. Uh, commensurate with uh, this study was um, a phase three uh, trial um, in the same age range of uh, patients who had two copies of f 508 l so the homozygous study. Um, at the time the study was done, uh, the standard of care was the dual combination modulator, um, tezacaftor, ivacaftor, or lumacaftor, ivacaftor, um, and so placebo uh, could not be used. It was, they had an active control. Um, but even still, um, they saw significant improvements on the order of 10% predicted uh, versus the dual uh, combination modulator at one month and health-related uh, quality of life improvements that uh, really were far above um, what would be uh, considered the minimum important difference. Uh, open label extension studies uh, have been published more recently um, in these trials um, of ETI in those greater than 12 years of age um, with at least one copy of f 508 del And similar to like I showed you a few minutes ago for Ivacaftor, um, in the heterozygote study in the left panel, um, those uh, patients who crossed over from placebo to the triple combination had um, a very similar um, magnitude of improvement in lung function. Um, and then in the homozygous study, um, those that crossed over from uh, the dual combination modulator, um, Simdeco, uh, Teziva, um, had um, a very uh, significant and similar increase in um, lung function. And these uh, studies go out to uh, 48 weeks um, and 40 weeks, respectively, of um, overall treatment. So uh, these effects um, appear to be durable. Uh, the same uh, story was true um, in this study for health-related quality of life. Um, again, I just kind of highlighted what is the minimum uh, clinically important difference here. Um, so uh, these subjects also had um, fewer uh, respiratory symptoms associated with that bump in lung function. Um, this slide, um, the only point I want to make here is that um, it, it shows the dramatic uh, nature of the impact of ETI on pulmonary exacerbation rates treated with IV antibiotics um, since it was approved by the FDA in the U.S. Um, in late October 2019. Um, so the orange uh, lines correspond to um, uh, adolescents and adults uh, 12 years or older. Uh, the blue lines um, correspond to um, kids with CF aged 11 uh, and younger. And because the uh, ETI was approved for um, an older population first, they had access. And so you can see that um, compared to the average uh, monthly number of exacerbations, uh, throughout 2019 um, into early 2020, things fell from 86% of that to 39% of that. And uh, things were stable in kids where we didn't have uh, that option at the time. Um, and then there was a distinct impact of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic on exacerbations, which um, there's kind of another story for another day. Um, very recently, um, we have had phase three open label uh, trial data of ETI in uh, kids with CF um, age six to 11 years with um, one or more copies of F508-DEL. Um, again, focusing on pharmacokinetics and here um, the uh, dose ranges that were uh, chosen in the study and, and what have come to, to pass as being approved for use um, uh, resulted in drug exposure comparable to um, adults. And also uh, these investigators showed uh, similar um, improvements in lung function to the, the tune of about nine to 10% predicted um, for uh, ETI um, in children and also um, pretty significant drops in uh, sweat chloride and I, I shouldn't gloss over um, quality of life um, as well. 
So this is uh, just a summary slide about the, the FDA label for ETI. Um, it's indicated for patients with CF over six years of age, um, uh, six years or older, I should say, um, with at least one copy of F508-DEL or mutations that have in vitro responsiveness um, to uh, the drugs. So where are we uh, headed next in terms of new discoveries? Um, for one thing, we can't really explain why some patients have more dramatic improvements um, in lung function than others. Um, these are data from the um, heterozygote study of uh, ETI um, and the original uh, study of um, uh, Ivacaftor in G551D patients. And basically, you know, you, you have to question how, what is it about a patient that has um, a greater than 30% predicted improvement in lung function versus, um, you know, 5%. Um, and uh, so we don't totally have the answers uh, to that. But um, I think this should lead us to, to counsel patients about, um, you know, that you could have health benefits other than uh, lung function bump um, uh, associated with modulator therapy. Um, we still know relatively little about um, sweat chloride uh, variation in the context of these newer drugs. Um, and so the CF Foundation has uh, commissioned the Check SC study, which is, uh, you can see the acronym there, uh, which is a large population-based study designed to uh, capture changes in sweat chloride as these modulators are rolled out as standard of care. Um, and it's also um, designed to comprehensively evaluate associations uh, between uh, modulator-related sweat chloride changes and other outcomes, uh, leveraging the uh, large CF Foundation patient registry. Uh, this slide is from Dr. Edith Semanik, one of the Czech SC um, investigators. Um, she's at Colorado Children's. Um, and uh, to date, um, they have collected over 3,600 sweat collections uh, with a total of 5,000 planned. Um, and because of how ETI rolled out, there was a, a pre and post ETI phase where some patients rolled over from uh, the dual modulator um, to uh, the triple combination modulator. Um, and uh, they have thousands of sweat collections. So we're, we're excited to see in the, the coming uh, months what this uh, study shows, um, it's still ongoing. Another um, prospective observational study um, designed to characterize the, the many benefits um, of ETI um, is called PROMISE. And uh, this is a 24-month study with um, pre-ETI and six-month and 24-month measurements of uh, the various parameters you see um, in the table. And it will uh, study uh, individuals with CF over 12 years of age, um, given um, how it rolled out uh, relative to, to FDA uh, guidance. And really, we hope to get more information about extrapulmonary effects of modulators. So what's going on with diabetes? Um, are there changes in the GI uh, microbiome? Um, what uh, effects does modulator uh, therapy have on uh, sinus disease and um, uh, uh, nutrition? So um, these, some of these results have already been uh, presented, but there's going to be um, a pediatric version of PROMISE that um, is going to continue. Uh, a study that I've been involved with as a PI over the, the past few years is called Simplify. So our group has recognized a unique opportunity to um, evaluate whether certain chronic therapies that I've um, illustrated are burdensome um, could be safely withdrawn in the context of ETI therapy. Uh, some of the survey work we did to plan for Simplify involved uh, querying patients and their families and uh, the CF care community about their willingness to, to participate in a trial of treatment withdrawal. And um, as shown by these uh, pie graphs, we had really overwhelming uh, support for the study um, from a, a grassroots level. So Simplify is a protocol designed to evaluate the independent effects of discontinuing hypertonic saline and Dornase Alpha in people with CF 12 years of age and older. Um, it actually consists of two randomized trials um, with a two-week run-in period to ensure stability um, and adherence to um, some of the metrics we're evaluating, um, and then a six-week randomization period to um, either continue um, the intervention or, or discontinue it. Um, the primary outcome measure is going to be change from baseline in percent predicted FEV1. And uh, because this is a non-inferiority um, set of studies, we have had to enroll a lot of patients. Um, and uh, 400 uh, subjects is the target for both study A, which is hypertonic saline, um, and study B um, as well. Um, and we have almost completed um, enrollment for this study, and hopefully uh, this fall in 2022, we'll be able to present some top-line uh, results from, from this uh, study. 
Um, the, the data from the CF Foundation uh, patient registry and, and our clinical experience uh, indicate that uh, a baby boom is going on um, among women uh, taking ETI, and that's supported by these uh, bar graphs here. There was already a little bit of an uptrend uh, before ETI, but you can see that things have uh, really accelerated. Um, and because we need to know um, about how highly effective modulators affect uh, maternal health and fetal outcomes, uh, the CF Foundation is sponsoring the Mayflower study, um, which is prospective, observational, um, uh, and uh, will be done at 40 care centers across the U.S. with a goal of um, enrolling 285 subjects. Uh, they'll look at uh, women who are pregnant um, on modulator therapy during their first trimester every three months and into their first postpartum year. Um, and I should mention this is a slide courtesy of uh, Dr. Jen Taylor Kauser at National Jewish in Colorado and uh, Dr. Raksha Jain at UT Southwestern who um, are leading that study. And I want to wrap up here in a couple minutes um, with a talk about how we can try to fix uh, the problem of class one mutations. Um, about 5% of the population um, uh, has those mutations and we don't have any protein uh, to modulate. So the, the foundation has a therapeutics development network um, and a drug development pipeline. Um, and this part of the pipeline focuses on fixing CFTR function. And I just want to talk uh, briefly about inhaled mRNA and adeno-associated viral uh, DNA vectors as a way to try to restore CFTR function. Um, Translate Bio um, and Sanofi uh, presented some uh, phase one and two uh, clinical trial data um, at the recent CF meeting this fall, um, and their uh, candidate MRT5005 is um, an optimized CFTR mRNA um, in lipid nanoparticles that is amenable to nebulization. Uh, in uh, this study, they uh, noted mild to moderate febrile reactions in about a third of subjects who received the product, and they didn't see any significant increase in lung function um, through uh, day 57 after five weekly doses uh, that you can see listed there, um, or day uh, 32 in an arm that uh, received five consecutive daily doses of uh, four milligrams um, versus placebo. And so these have been presented in abstract form. Another strategy um, involves the um, adeno-associated viral vector um, with uh, CFTR uh, gene. Um, and so this is how this uh, paradigm would work. So um, the vector um, binds and is taken up by a respiratory epithelial cell by classic endocytosis. And hopefully uh, the genome could be delivered to the nucleus where it's integrated with that of the host and we would um, have wild type CFTR uh, transcription. Um, and, and I'm sorry, translation, um, so that we get protein. Um, one of the problems uh, highlighted by this slide is that these vectors can also trigger um, an immunogenic response. Um, so uh, vectors could be degraded and presented um, to uh, uh, antigen-specific uh, CD8 T cells um, via class uh, 1 MHC, um, and also anti-capsid antibodies could get generated as part of this process. So we could have a, um, a two-pronged immune response that really um, uh, negates the, the benefit of this uh, theoretical approach. Um, another um, abstract presented at the meeting uh, was that from Spirovent, they have um, SPT-101, uh, which is an AAV capsid um, selected to be trophic for the surfaces of human airway epithelial cells, um, into which a um, CFTR mini gene and regulatory elements are um, localized. Um, this group um, found that uh, this vector can be um, enhanced uh, with respect to translation to the uh, uh, nucleus with nebulized doxorubicin. Uh, the uh, data presented at the meeting were from uh, animal models. Um, it turns out that ferrets have a, a pretty high fidelity for the uh, human airway. Um, and so these investigators um, saw that they could get um, CFTR mRNA expression uh, with their construct about a tenfold increase um, after administration of doxorubicin um, via inhalation, both, both via inhalation. Um, but that um, didn't really seem to increase over 12 weeks. But, but it does prove um, the, the uh, concept is, is viable. So a few take home points. Um, 
there have been decades of work uh, in human genetics and high throughput drug discovery um, that have now ushered in an era of pharmacologic restoration for uh, CFTR function in, in most, but importantly, uh, not all people. And uh, we really have an urgent need for strategies to try to restore CFTR function uh, in that population uh, that doesn't have a modulator um, available. And we have a, a lot to learn about the basis for these variable clinical responses to modulators, uh, the extra pulmonary effects of uh, these drugs, and uh, the safety of withdrawing uh, mainstays of therapy that we've had over the years um, that may be uh, safely dispensable um, with some reduction in treatment burden. Um, and I should also mention we have um, a whole lot to learn about maternal and fetal outcomes um, in uh, women who take ETI throughout their pregnancy. Um, so with that, I'll close, and I appreciate your attention. Thanks so much, Dr. Gifford. Um, just for the for the maybe newer faculty or, or uh, residents uh, on this uh, Zoom, here at, at UH Rainbow Case Western has been a major center for CF care and research one of the major centers in North America going back, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years, Dr. Gifford, I'm not sure. Right, right, it's on, on par with that, 50 to 60. Yeah, and then, and then you know, Dr. Gifford is a, you know joined us not too long ago to be part of this long tradition of, of CF care and research. And so just want to welcome you again and put this in context and give we'll take questions. Thanks, Dr. Arnold, appreciate it. And thanks for great grand rounds. So uh, Keith, this is Bob Salata and Alex, thank you very much for that. Very in-depth and- oh, You're uh, welcome, thank you. Important uh, information. How much do these modulators cost on an average, on average right. each year? Um, we are, we're talking um, 250 to 300,000. So it, it raises uh, a lot of uh, interesting questions um, uh, about drug pricing and availability. And, uh, you know, it, I think due diligence has been uh, done to characterizing the health benefits, particularly with respect to uh, keeping patients out of the hospital. Um, so um, even though that the price is steep, I think that it's translated to be meaningful. And is insurance covering this? Yes. Um, there, there are always exceptions and, and uh, you know, advocacy we have to uh, perform, but, but yes. Okay. Uh, there's one question, uh, Alex, in the chat. Any clinical trials for gene delivery or editing for CF patients here at UH? Great, uh, great question. Um, uh, I assure you, it wasn't wasn't planted out there, but um, we uh, we are uh, going to be participating in one of the um, adeno associated viral uh, vector studies. Um, we're also um, participating in uh, studies focusing on um, uh, anti-inflammatory strategies for CF. We have contributed to um, the uh, liposomal um, RNA uh, uh, study, so um, we we are definitely um, involved um, as a therapeutics development. Network network site in uh, furthering this pipeline. Great, and uh, Suleen's one of our MedGenetics combined uh, MedGenetics residents, so getting the genetics question in, so. That's great. Uh, great lecture, Dr. Gefford. Um, thank you so much. I'm actually very interested in cystic fibrosis, and um, I published last year on um, an article on the um, impact of altered gut microbiome on cystic fibrosis. And now that you mentioned um, uh, that we were talking about the differential response to ETI, um, is it possible that the gut microbiome has a role in this differential uh, response, especially with the accumulative insult to the gut microbiome by the prolonged and repeated courses of antibiotics? Right, that's a, that's a great question. Um, there, there's a longstanding uh, story um, in CF about gut dysbiosis and maybe this uh, gut-lung axis um, in terms of, uh, and we know that the, uh, there's dysbiosis of the CF lung as well. Um, antibiotics um, over years and years have to contribute. Um, from the uh, PROMISE study, this um, observational study pre and post ETI, um, they will um, have uh, stool samples and other uh, GI metrics that will hopefully let us um, understand uh, what is happening to the microbiome. Maybe, maybe we move from dysbiosis to um, a more normal um, distribution of flora in the gut and the lung. Awesome. Thank you.
I think, you know, it's one o'clock. Um, again, I want to thank you for a really superb talk and, and uh, kind of welcome again to Case Western UH Rainbow. So thanks, Alex. Great to be here and thanks for having me. I appreciate it.